before a court comes out to see me, and they start a reply request, praise. Let's say you uh, remember uh, we're married. Uh, that was days before, but he still needs a lot of prayer. And uh, Steve and Carol are on the road right now for vacation, so remember them. And that several's not here, we just pray for them and start a lot of prayer. Thank you. 
phone. You got around that church. They were so they were so annoying. We did a church meeting there. It was kind of empty. Maybe one or two people there. And so I said, let's just walk around and talk to Brother Kerry. And so he began to tell me about it.
first thing that the radio on the first earth tower would have known was when they were when that planet was eventually going to leave the earth and there was a huge cube there. Which it's not just the United States, but can that not be something that we take a far look at? If it keeps spreading out like it's spreading right now, it's get it's getting ready to have a serious problem with human life if that's what that Thank you. You can use this for something to progress in the world. Even now. If you want to, you can also see how the radio tower
this time I'd call our business section to order. Brother Gary has a couple of financial reports available. If you don't have one, wave at him. He'll make sure that you get one. Uh, as he's doing that, I'd ask Miss Honey to come and give us our uh, minutes. Previous month's meeting was late at the Kirk Park. Motion to accept as read was made by Brother Johnny Barra and seconded by Brother Steve Douglas and motion approved. There were no requests for correspondence or letters of this time. The treasurer's report was given on paper form. A motion to approve the report was made by Brother Andy Nisenberg. Second made by Brother Johnny Magara and motion carried. There was no old business to review. In the form of new business, there was another monetary donation of $200 for replacing the Kirk sign. This brings the total to $550. The building and grounds committee will discuss replacement and get estimates. A motion to adjourn was made by Brother Steve Douglas and seconded by Brother Andy Nisenberg. Any questions, comments, additions, deletions to the minutes? Not, I'd entertain a motion to approve. Brother Johnny, do I have a second? Brother Eric? No discussion. All in favor say aye. Opposed right sign. That motion carries. Also, you should have in front of you a copy of the treasurer's report. Take time to look over that. Um, Ms. Brenda, is there anything you need to point out on our treasurer's report? Ms. Fusia? All right. Give you just a second if you've got any questions or any anything you might want clarification on. Except the treasurer's report is given. I see Brother Randy back there. Do I have a second? Brother Johnny? Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Opposed right sign. And that motion carries as well. Is there any old business to come before the church? In, in regards to the signage, uh, what do you think we should bring it up on a Sunday morning to talk about? Is that what you're after? What are you thinking? Get one. do have ideas, get with somebody on the Buildings and Grounds Committee and, and see what they know. Any others? Any new business to come before the church? One thing I will mention um, is obviously we're looking at uh, aggressively uh, doing our Bible school this year. It's not next week, but the following week. Correct, Lisa? One of the things that I'm going to recommend that we do is find the time, uh, obviously, with our young people and our young adults and, and others to go out and, and help hand out flyers. So, Lisa, if you want to try and come up with a date to do that uh, and some locations, and I think we've got several that we've done in the past, um, we, we really need to get on that and get after that and make folks aware 
like everything else, people are just waiting to have those opportunities, but if they don't know about it, they don't know to take advantage of it. So we, we need to be thinking and, and praying about how God would already prepare the table, so to speak, as we go out and share about our harvest. I will tell you that the association uh, is going to start mission as, as well for those churches that are not having Bible school this year. They're sort of letting the word get out that if, uh, if they'd like to attend, then they certainly need to watch the tape. So uh, maybe there's other folks that won't be able to have a Bible school that can come and sit and take part this year. Any other new business? So we adjourn to our next business meeting. With that being said, take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 18. And it, this is sort of the second part, if you would, of this part two, uh, if you would, of this interlude that we have uh, between chapter 16 and, and chapter 19 and 20. The, uh, this is the follow-up of that. And so we're going to be looking at that tonight, uh, Revelation chapter 18. Last week, if you remember in Revelation chapter 17, we talked about the organization of religion. Now, don't get confused with what the, that is not the church. That is not uh, us. That is, that is this worldly setup. That, and I would even go so far as to say it, it's basically uh, a setup just to set up ceremonies and to do different things, idols, all those things. It's just their way of celebrating uh, the, the beast and, and Satan and all that. I mean, it's, it's just a design by man, created by man, for man. And then we found out that uh, the people got so aggravated with that that they got tired of even having that. And so they literally just said, we don't need that. We can be our own gods. We can be our own people. We don't need worship of any kind. And so they literally destroyed that setup or that uh, religious moment or that religious sector of life, and they stripped it of all of its wealth and all of its uh, beauty and all of its glory that it had uh, possessed upon itself for their own self and selfishness. And so they literally, and you've heard of eating your young, that's what they did. They ate that which they created. Now we're getting to a point where we're going to look about the political and economic and social part of life in chapter 18, and we're going to see how that falls apart as well during these last days. And the interesting thing, this is not one of those things that takes a lot of time to happen, and you're going to see that in just a moment. It is a very quick and very solid and very aggressive destruction. Now remember, again, this is all an interlude, but I want you to look at the response by those who are saved, those who put their trust in God versus those who did not and have have a worldly view and believe in the world more than God and, and don't believe in God or doesn't, doesn't confess God. And we're going to see how that plays out. But let's look together. Revelation chapter 18, we're going to begin reading with verse 1. The Bible says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now I want to stop for just a moment. I want you to think about what that very first verse says. Listen again what it says. It says, and the earth was lightened with his glory. I want to take you back to a verse and, and just ponder this verse in your mind. That which is done in darkness shall be brought to the light. You know, when we talk about the world of Babylon during this time, when we talk about worldly events and worldly things, that we think about how the, to the world everything looks glamorous. Uh, you, all I've got to do is take you back and look at commercials, and that's how the world sees uh, all the debauchery of the world. They look at it through the eyes of a commercial. But for the Christian, we see it as the results on the ground. And, and I used an example of alcohol as being one of them, how that it's always the fittest, the prettiest, the best-looking, the, the healthiest-looking folks are those on, on the commercials that are drinking, but in reality, we know that it's usually not that way at all. It's usually 
an ugly scene of somebody that's that's uh, literally caused themselves to be sick. It's caused themselves to be out of control. And, and so there's a much darker side to it that is not on the commercial, but is certainly a very, very real part uh, of that particular sin. And so when we talk about this, uh, whatever is in the darkness, it's going to come to the light. We read right here that this angel, when he comes, it enlightens the world, meaning it shines a picture or it shines a light right down on the world so that everybody can see here is the truth. And so going forward with number two, let's look together. It says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance and uh, with the abundance of her delicacy. I want to stop right there for a moment, and, and we'll pick up four in just a second. Brother Gary said something tonight, and I don't know if you noticed it, but as we were talking, the mention of worldly events and how things are going chaotic, and how the things just seem to be spiraling further and further out of control, and and he made the comment about. Uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Haiti and some of those areas and, and some of that stuff. Going on. Let me take you deeper into the, the actual uh, environment that we live in today. China is bragging about running America out of international waters that they declare are theirs. You've got Haiti, who, have, who has just assassinated a president. You have Cuba which is up in an uprising right now, we're not that far remo removed from Washington, D.C., having folks storm the Capitol. And, and, of course, we've had people say it's an insurrection. We've had people say, no, it's just a, 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 a bout of, a, of rebels and, and, and trying to really be the, the people to bring back our country to where it was. And then you can go out west and you can see in Portland and others where they had riots in the streets and we've had murders and, and in fact just this past weekend you had 111 deaths and murders in Chicago and I just would ask you this does it sound to you like things are in control and I'm going to tell you something they are they are in control God still has control God says I still have my hand on it all of this is chaos all this is sin finding out its own sin sin judging its own self. All those things are there, and God still has his hand on it. Imagine a time or a day where God says, all right, it's all you. Go wear yourselves out. That's the chaos we're talking about. We think it's chaotic now. Wait when God finally says, all right, I'm going to pull back and let things happen. And then God forbid add the other chaos that comes when God says, okay, now I'm going to judge it. And that's where we're at in this passage of Scripture. God is now going to judge Babylon. You say, Tim, what is Babylon? What does that mean? And, and I could point out that that could be a city. I could point out that that could be a nation. I could point out that could be a culture. I could point out that that could be just a, a lifestyle. But I'm going to tell you something, and this is what we need to be careful of not to overlook. To us, the, the decisions that we make, we become Babylon if we choose to reject Christ, or we become Christians and we become part of the saints. That's your two options. You can be part of the saints, and therefore you can expect that the city of Babylon, that which is against God, is going to target you and come after you. You say, Tim, what do you mean? What are you saying? In this day and age, even with the Holy Spirit here, even with the church active, even with God having his hand upon you, the world has already found its way to hate you. Have you noticed that? Johnny and I, we've talked about this a couple of times. I want, I want us to go back one year ago, and, and uh, yeah, one year ago, we were dealing with not necessarily the full corona, but we were dealing with some aftermath of being closed. We were trying to get open. We were trying to get in the building. We were trying to do these things. And so about a year ago, we were starting to come in the building and, and doing those things, getting ready to do those things. I think they were, had painted the building, and, and actually there was a lot to be excited about as far as getting back in the building. My question is, where is everybody? 
Who is it? You know, I, and, and I'm, I'm going to be uh, inquisitive for just a moment. How many times were, were you asked, why isn't the church meeting? All right? That was the question. Why isn't the church meeting? And yet today, the church is meeting. Why aren't the people here? You know, and, and I do blame some on us for, for closing. I, and, and I've told Eric and, and Brother Gary, I said that was one of the hardest decisions we made. We tried to keep people safe. In that, we probably made some mistakes. And one of the biggest problems I've got is the idea of knowing that by doing so, we probably have given people the excuse to stay at home. And that bothers me. But I'm going to go back to what I said. Whose responsibility is it for people, for you, not for people, for you? Whose responsibility is it for you to be in God's house? It's yours. God says, I came into the world. I sent my son that he might die on the cross for you. I gave my son's life so that you might receive salvation, that you might be forgiven of sin, and that you might call to be my disciple, that you might follow after me, that you might do my will. And everything that God has done, he has done for you. Now, I say you, I include myself in that. Everything that God has done, it has been for me personally. It's been for you personally. There's nothing about this that I can lay on Johnny. This is about me and my relationship with Christ. I can't blame Johnny for my life and my relationship with Christ. That's on him. And so I'm puzzled at a time when I look around and I see so much that should drive us to church. Why is the church fading away? Or why is the church failing to grab people to bring them into this place? This ought to be a packed out place today. You know why? Because you ought to be scared to death to go out there. The world is not your friend. The world doesn't want to be your friend. But here's what has happened. The world has actually applauded those who have stayed away to the point that now it's easier to stay away. I, um, I made the statement to somebody at work the other day that I am shocked that, and, and don't get me wrong, when our church decides to do something, that's all right, we get to do that. But I am shocked and stunned that every American in this country didn't rise up in revolt when all of a sudden they began to say you couldn't do something. That just blows my mind. I can say it. I can encourage it. I can do those things, but the government should have never have told the church to shut the door. You know why? Because the church is supposed to not infringe upon our rights as citizens to worship God. Now, can we have the debate of whether it was wise to do or not do? Yes, absolutely. And, and that could go on and on. But you know what's a challenge for me? What do we do if in October this Delta variant is, is aggressive and now for the safety of all Americans, the churches don't need to meet? The bars can stay open, liquor stores can stay open, grocery stores can stay open, but not the churches because you're singing church, you're hugging church, you can't have church. Who's going to stand up and say, that's wrong? And I'm going to say this, we just saw it play out less than six months. You say, Tim, what are you talking about? We had a church that had to go and literally get the Supreme Court to rule that they could actually have church. In fact, if you remember in Kentucky, they were told they couldn't even have drive-in church. Staying in their car. That's what we face today. And why is that? Because there is an anger and a hatred towards God. And because we love and serve Him, there's an anger and a hatred towards us. Now, I, I hope that you're not taking that and saying to yourself, man, Tim's gotten political. That, that's not what it's about. This is not about politics. This isn't about, uh, you know, Democrat, Republican. This isn't about who's in office and who's not. This isn't even about science and not science. This is about asking yourself this question. If the devil wanted to attack the church, he has already set up everything he needs to do to set up the attack, to do the attack, to execute the attack, and ultimately the church is never to be there. That by we fail. I will say I, I will say this. The devil 
the devil knew how to hit us. And he hit us with our complacency. You know what's interesting? There are other countries that are having revival right now because they can't meet in open like we do. They can't sit here and worship like we do. They'll walk the six miles on a Sunday morning to be able to go to church because they can't wait to get there because really and truly, they aren't supposed to, but they can't miss it. They want to do it so much they, they love it. Johnny, you had mentioned it in your prayer. We have lost that first step. When we go back, I, and, and I'm going to do this at the conclusion, I'm going to go back and we're going to hit the first four chapters again, and we're going to talk about those four chapters and how they laid out exactly how the rest of Revelation plays out. Everything that was done was at the fault of the church. We had the chance to win the lost. We had the chance to, to reach lost people for him. We had the chance to build a foundation for Christians. We had a chance to, to literally get on knees and pray and ask God to, to redeem people and to save people and to hold back his judgment, to hold back all those things that he had planned for us, to delay the second coming of Christ till we reach others and and we had the chance to do all those things. But as we read the first four chapters, we see that it was on the church that we slipped and we let those cracks sort of get bigger and bigger and bigger until it was too big. And I'll give you an example of that before we go to, that chapter, to verse 4. In my driveway, if you go to my house now and you pull up my driveway, I'll caution you to try and stay left because on the right side, I have a huge hole there. Last year, it was about like this big. That's all it was, just a little bitty part. And Dad told me a year ago, Tim, you need to go out there, you need to seal that up, you need to patch that area and seal that up. And I wasn't really paying attention. Nah, I'm all right. About winter time, I started noticing, man, that's getting a little rough. I probably need to do that this spring. Spring came around and it rained. I mean, all the time. It just seemed like it always was raining. You never came. Guess what's today out there? Today, there's a big hole, and if you're driving down the road, you call it a pothole, right there in my driveway. And Daryl looks at me and says, why didn't you fix that last year when it was little? And you know my statement? I don't know, because I don't know. I don't have a reason, right? I don't know. What's funny is, Johnny, guess what happened last year? Everything shut down. I had plenty of time to fix a little pothole. Now, it's a huge pothole, have no time to fix it, probably going to tear up a car before it's done, all because I have no real excuse for that. But isn't that the church? We don't need Bible school this year. Let's go back till next year. We don't need to hand out those flyers. Let's wait till next year. We don't need to worry about our children this year. Let's wait till next year. Big problem right there. What happens if there is not a next year for the church? I can't stress that enough. Now let's go on. Let's keep on going to verse 4. Verse 4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double." How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she hath said in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Now listen to this. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they, uh, when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. That's the kings. We recognize those as the rulers, right? They're going to sit there and they're going to start lamenting the fact that Babylon has been destroyed. And, and literally, they use the phrase, and you'll see this again, one hour. One hour. Let's go to the next one. 
Now we're going to look at the merchants, the money. The merchandise of go, uh, excuse me, verse 11, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stone and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thy and wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and the souls of men. Did we miss any of those? I mean, that's just about everything, right? And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for her for fear of torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. You know, when I read that passage of Scripture, one of the passages of Scripture that come to mind is the passage about the man who built the barn. You remember that, the silos? Tear down the old silos, build up new silos, and then what happened? What happened to him? He died. Everything was all about stuff. You know, they put the emphasis on stuff. And now, all the stuff is for naught. I don't know about you, but... I know that I've heard today people are getting so excited about this about this money that they're going to get for their children. I think it's two fifty or five, three hundred or whatever, you know. And they're excited about this extra money coming in and, and all that, and that's great. I don't have a problem with that. And if you can pay bills with that and, and stay afloat with that, I'm all about it. But let me say this: money has never, ever, ever been the salvation of the soul. It won't ever. Be. Only Jesus Christ himself can save the soul. And what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? The merchants of this day, they look at this city, they realize that it's literally uh, torn down in an hour. It's gone, it's done, one hour's time, it's over with. And they're sitting there, and not only has the political structure uh, sort of crumbled, but now all of a sudden they're looking, and sure enough, the, the financial structure of it's crumbling. And now we're getting ready to go into a different part. I want you to look at verse, uh, at the same verse, verse 17, as we continue. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their head and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Now let me, let me go back to my illustration earlier. If you want to see some things play out that will give you a little bit of insight on what's going to happen this day, what happened, and it wasn't within an hour, but it could be within an hour, it wasn't this last time, but what happened when all of a sudden the coronavirus hit and all of a sudden people started realizing that the, that the one place that seemed to be a big catalyst for spreading it happened to be cruise ships? What happened? What happened to the people that were on the cruise ships at that time? Do you remember that? I can't imagine being stuck at... I've been on a cruise once before, and I didn't like three days' worth of it. I can't imagine being on a ship for that long of a period of time. And in this case, it was worse because they were sitting there phoning back on their uh, what phones they had, trying to tell people, look, get us off this thing. They're not even letting us out of our rooms. I can't imagine that, right? Just imagine in one hour's time something, and, and I'm going to use the Delta virus again. It's that Delta variance again. What happens if all of a sudden we open up the cruise ships, we go back to cruising, and that happens again? Just to let you know, that wasn't just on cruises, by the way. Guess what else happened? You also had 
a, a ship that was in our Navy happened, and that commander got fired. The ship had several people die. And, and literally, uh, I, I don't remember the number, but it was a large number of people ended up contracting the coronavirus. It wasn't just limited to one. I mean, it literally swept through, right? When God gets ready to judge, he's not going to need a coronavirus to do it. And we're going to see in just a moment what, what happens. But God doesn't need a coronavirus to set these things in motion. Literally, God doesn't need anything other than his voice, right? How did he speak the world into existence? He spoke. He spoke. All right. Let there be light. Let there be dirt. Let there be water. Let the seas have different things. Let, it, uh, let the world have vegetation. Put animals in the sea. Put animals on land. Oh, I'm going to save my very best for the last. I'm going to put man out there, and I'm going to make man in my own image. And there he created us. And literally, at the voice, these things were created. I want you to think about this for a moment, by the way. God took special interest in creating man. God took special interest in creating us. Do you think he also is going to take special interest when we choose to neglect or even to rebel against him? The Bible says he did, right? What happened in, uh, in the Garden of Eden? I told you not to do it. You did it. You're now out of the Garden of Eden, right? Folks, these things, when they begin to unfold, they're going to unfold quickly, and it's going to be dramatic. People are going to recognize it. And the response of the world, the response of the people on the world at that time is going to be one of misery, one of wailing, one of disappointment, one of sadness. And then I want you to see the second side of this. And this is us. And then verse 20, it says, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the, of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by their sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And verse 20 says, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Do you feel beaten up tonight? I'm just going to, and you don't have to answer that back to me, but do you ever just feel like sometimes this world can get the better end of you as a Christian? Do you ever feel like that you're just fighting a battle that you can't seem to win? Understand that God does not allow the Christian to stay settled for very long. There are times that he allows us to have times of peace, but he wants us to be active and out mobily reaching others for Christ. This past year, I'm going to say that God has given us a time of rest and that we now need to get busy. If you look around and you see some folks that aren't here tonight, it's not a point of judging. I don't want you to be judging. I, I mean, let's just be honest and confess it to each other. That could be us. We could be, uh, we could be at home too, right? That's not what it's about. This is about awakening the Christian to the idea that time is short. This says that that city was destroyed in an hour. I want you to know that God will come at the sound of a trump in the twinkling of an eye. And that that time is drawing nigh. And I can tell you this, I don't know when it's going to be. I don't know how soon it's going to be. I don't know where it's going to be as far as how it's going to take place. But I can tell you this, we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. 
And there's going to be one day that does not have a tomorrow. And you think that through. We're one day closer than we were yesterday, and we want to get to one day that does not have a tomorrow. Tomorrow is not going to come. The day is the day of the Lord. The day is the day He comes. You're not going to say He'll come tomorrow. He's going to come that day. And there's going to be one day that comes where you're going to look and say, I'm closer today than I was yesterday. And then you're going to look forward and say, but there is no tomorrow. He has come this day. And the question is this. When He comes, are we doing and have we done all that God would want us and need us to do? I'll put it this way. If you know someone who's lost, have you done everything in your power to reach that person before he dies? If Jesus comes tonight, have you? can you honestly leave this world knowing, man, I gave my all to try and reach that person for Jesus. I knew that person was lost, and I did everything I could to reach out. Here's the scarier part. Do you know those folks around you? Do you know that they know Jesus? How many times have we just assumed they know Jesus? How many times have we just assumed, well, they come to church? How many times do we just assume, well, they're good people, they seem to have good morals and ethics, they must be a Christian? How do we know without asking, do you know the time and do you know the place where you opened your heart up to Jesus to ask him to save you? And Johnny and I, we, we talk about this song all the time, about uh, it was on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, all the way through the week. And then there's that day of it was someday. You know, we, we don't know the exact day, but we remember the day. We remember that there was a time I came up. Might not be able to put my exact finger on the date or the, what it was. Might be too young or whatever. But I remember the day that I did. I remember what I said. And I remember that Jesus was there. Folks, it's not about the day. It's not about the time. It's about that moment where you confessed your sins to Jesus and the response that he gave to you is, I love you, and yes, I'll forgive you. We need to be about reaching those lost people for Jesus. But tonight, I want to challenge you. As you look around, if there's people that are not here in this building, for whatever reason, and it really doesn't matter what the reason is, we as Christians need to reach out to them and just simply say, hey, I missed you Wednesday. I'm praying for you. I can't wait to see you Sunday. And just let that be it. Just let that be it. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Let that be it. And, and we're just going to pray that God might just really touch their heart and bring them back. Because you know what? This is the ideal time for this church and every church to break out in revival and let the world know that, yes, there's still a Jesus. Yes, he still loves all of humanity. Yes, he still wants to see souls saved. And yes, he's still in the forgiving of sin business if you're willing to confess to him. Anyone got a word they want to share before we dismiss tonight? Anybody got? Well, I will tell you that I, I I'm thankful for you being here as well. But I will tell you that God is God is so good. And he's here every time I'm here. You know, every time I've shown up, God's here. And that's what's exciting about coming to church. It's not, I love seeing Johnny, but it's not about Johnny. I, I love seeing Brother Gary, but it's not about Brother Gary. This is about coming and saying, Jesus, this place has been set aside for you. And at this moment and this time, it is all truly about you. And I may fail you at other times, but not when I'm here. Not when I'm here. Anyone else? Thank you, Johnny. Anyone else? If not, would you stand as we dismiss with prayer? I'm going to ask uh, Brother Gary, would you dismiss us tonight?